So again, for those who weren't with me on Sunday, it's just worth briefly mentioning that at the end of the day, we have to really focus and, and, and mourn the loss of, of the tzaddik of our generation, or Khan Kanievsky, who passed away on Friday. And the world's not the same when you have a tzaddik in the world, and then that tzaddik leaves us, we're orphaned and we don't have the protection. And maybe, maybe I've seen it in the past when a tzaddik dies, often tragedies can happen in the world because we don't have that protection, that awful tragedy that happened 48 hours ago where four holy souls got killed in, in, in Israel, awful and tragic. And sometimes that's, we don't have the spiritual protection we need. And therefore I really feel all of us, we need to galvanize ourselves and strengthen ourselves and work even harder and learn even more to, to create protection in the world that's needed, especially now. Rukhan Kanievsky really he was born in the Ukraine in 1928, and he became one of the great, what's called the Tsar Torah. He became Prince of Torah. Why? Because he literally woke up at two o'clock in the morning every day and started learning from two o'clock a.m. And he was learning Zohar initially and, and, and a lot of mysticism. And then he goes to Code of Jewish Law and Maimonides and then the Tanakh, and then eight pages of Talmud every single day. He finished the whole Torah every year. A, cool, a few cool, very um, amazing stories that I've learned this week about him. Story number one, a, a young man came to see him. He was, he was 36 years old, came to see him asking for a blessing, asking for a blessing to get married. Adrokham Kanievsky, he was able to look at you, see your aura, see your souls, kind of know all of what's going on, previous lives, the whole shit. Anyway, he looked, at, he looked at the man and said, maybe she's not born yet with a twinkle in his eye, which this poor 36-year-old guy is now pretty devastated. It's like, hello, I'm 36. She's not born yet. That means at, at the very best, let's say she's born tonight, and then I get married to her when she's 18 years old. That means I'm only getting married at 54. Great news. He was not impressed. He left the rabbi's house a little bit upset. Anyway, six months later, he's standing under the chuppah. And he suddenly realizes, ah, now I understand the blessing. Because soon after he met the rabbi, he started dating this amazing girl who converted to Judaism. And she only converted a couple of days after the blessing. And the Talmud says, Ger Shaniskayek, and the Kotin Shanoilad, a convert. The convert is like a new birth. It's a rebirth. It's something brand new. It's like a new baby. And Rukhaim knew that. And he, therefore, he says, with this twinkle in his eye, maybe she's not born yet. He knew exactly what was happening, but that blessing obviously worked. Next story, he's sitting there learning with a chavrosa, and he's learning about the Talmud. And there's this case in the Talmud about locusts and about a locust kosher. And Reb Chaim turns to his chavrosa and says, it's really hard for me to understand because I've actually never seen physically a locust before. It would be amazing if Hashem would be allow, allow me to see a locust. The Chavrosa says, um, just look over there. That moment with the open window, Hashem blew in a locust and it literally just arrived at his windowsill. And then he was able to go and venture and have a look and then understand genuinely what it looked like to understand why it's kosher when his father-in-law, who's a great Sadiq, Rabbi Yoshev, heard about that story. Rabbi Yoshev says, wow. Rabbi Yoshev said, stories like that happen often to what's called Rishonim. Great rabbis in the time of Rashi Maimonides, when they were the Nachmonides, when they would learn about a material and they would need it, how miracles would happen. Hashem would enable them to, to see what they needed to see. And it's amazing that this Rukhan Kanievsky, who's living in our generation, got miracles to the level of what happened a thousand years ago. Just shows that the, the power of the sage. But he was also just a charming, amazing husband. So, for example, if any, any spouse is there, he, he would only eat his food. If his wife was sitting there eating too, this, none, none of this like his wife's bringing in the food for him or she's cooking in the kitchen, forget about it. Forget about it. He would only start his meal if his kids were there once his wife was sitting down, even if it meant that, that the food was gonna go cold, didn't care. His wife was his queen and, and he looked up to her tremendously and loved her tremendously and, and he didn't start eating. I think it's a beautiful thing. Sometimes when you're eating as a family, sometimes, Whoever's got the first food starts eating. It's not respectful. And I think one needs to wait, A, for the parents, and B, the parents need to wait for each other as well. And Rukhaim taught that. But what was interesting is his son comments that often at the end of a meal, 
he would say to his son, um, what did I just eat? He forgot the food he ate because he was zero interested in his food. His food was simply his fuel to get him to continue to, to be a learning and to give blessings and, and, and to serve God. It's literally, it was like when you put fuel in the car, the car doesn't ask what type of fuel is it? Is it unleaded or leaded today or diesel? The car couldn't care less. It just needs to be loaded up with the fuel for a Khan Kanievsky, whereas we're the opposite. Like it's all about the food, right? We'll go to a specific restaurant because we can't wait to taste that kind of food and that kind of food. And not saying that we shouldn't enjoy our food, but I'm saying maybe we understand what a tzaddik is. A tzaddik is someone that the material world is there simply to benefit the spiritual world, not to be um, served in and of itself. Anyway, there are a few little stories. And I said to you on Sunday, my last interaction with the tzaddik, thank God I was able to go several times to see him and get blessings, to take people to him. I'm actually going to miss the fact that I can't do that now next time he's going to want to get back to Israel. But my last interaction with him is when he saw my name and saw what was needed, he prophetically said that I need to start making habdala with wine. Somehow he knew that I've got stomach intolerance to wine and I was using grape juice for many, many years. And he was saying, actually, if you start having even a little bit of wine, it's going to bring a lot more blessing in your life. He's right. And I advise you, my friends, to use actual, even if it's just a little bit of wine, in your Friday night Kiddush cup and in your Havdalah cup as well. So that's a little tribute to the great Sadiq Rukhaim Kanievsky. Look him up. Okay, this week's Sedra. We're going to talk about tonight the power of Emunah. David's going to have got two hours of it. He's just been learning about Emunah. We're now going to learn Emunah, Rabbi Hill style. And life's all about Emunah, my friends. It's all about Emunah. King David says, in Psalms 119, every mitzvah is really bad. Every mitzvah you do is just another way of learning faith, of learning relationship to Hashem. And Muna isn't merely intellectual faith in Hashem. It's more being in love with Hashem. It's more, you know, the word emunah can mean loyalty, being loyal to Hashem. It can mean, according to Kabbalah, Rabbi Nachman says from the words oimen, it's a summon down. It says in the Megillah by Yehoimenes Hadassah, Achashverosh summoned Queen Esther. So Emunah sometimes, from the law of attraction perspective, when you really believe in something, 100% from the law of attraction concept, we have real Emunah, like Rabbi Chaim had, had real Emunah, that a locust would appear and a locust appeared. And so that's how Sadiqim live their life. You, you think you can manifest. So Emunah's the aspect of manifestation as well. But we're going to speak about a unique aspect. Really, we can speak for hours and hours about it. And there's so many areas to speak about. I'm going to focus on a few specific areas and specifically connected to this week's Torah section. Anyone want to message in? What is this week's Torah section? Anyone know? Shemini. 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 It is Shemini. And there's a very, very intense story. It's an intense story. The story goes like this. Our high priest, Aaron Akain Gadol, the high priest, had two, had a few, four sons, two of them, very holy, incredibly holy, Nodov and Avihu, Nodov and Avihu, very, very holy Khanim, very holy sons. And mystics would say that they actually had the same level of Moses and Aaron. They, could, they were on the same spiritual level of Moshe and Aaron, Moses and Aaron. And, and the Bible goes on to say, the Bible goes on to say that they made the decision to do their own sacrifice in their own unique way and actually to do something which wasn't recommended to get drunk at the sacrifice. And they didn't get drunk because they wanted to have a party and have a rave and let loose. They were doing it for Hashem. They were doing it for Hashem. As we learned about last time when we spoke about the idea of getting drunk, it's actually a way to release and, and get to a higher spiritual place. And on a deep level, they were so in love with Hashem that they almost wanted to come out of their body and give Hashem an embrace, which is really how all the Jewish people felt. Then if you remember, when you were at Sinai, when Hashem spoke to us all, we all almost had, we all had an out-of-body experience. And it was the magical, the most magical, incredible, falling in love, oneness experience of all. And not of an Avi who wanted that and more. But they weren't allowed to do that, and they died. Hashem actually brought down a fire, and that fire burnt them alive. And they became the sacrifice. And when Aaron Akoyen heard about it, 
when he heard his children had died. Okay, and God forbid the concept of one that parents should never have to bury their children. It's not the way it should go. And they weren't just children, they were his, they, he thought they would be the next leaders of the Jewish people. They would continue the legacy, they would continue the transmission for him and his brother, Moshe started. When he died, the most amazing verse said in this week's etc. It says, by Yidaim Aharon, Aaron was silent. The word Bayidom, a very unusual word in the Torah. Bayidom was silent. Some mystics say it's connected to the word stone. Like he was quiet as a stone. He was just heavy. It just, he said nothing. In other words, he didn't do what most people do, which says, Hashem, what are you playing at? How dare you do that? I'm angry with you. I'm going to shout to you, Hashem. I've been doing all this for you, and this is what you do for me. You kill my kids. He didn't do that. He just... In fact, I believe the concept of a minute silence, which often we have, comes from this notion that the, that the reaction to the tragedy was silence, meaning not to ask why, not to complain, not to sue Hashem, not to be bitter, not to have what's called a Yerida, a descent. And this was his way of displaying emunah in this moment. He had such emunah in Hashem. Yes, it hurts. And he didn't necessarily understand. He took it and he said, if this is what you want, Hashem, so be it. It's your world. And in fact, they're your children. So I think the, the concept of a minute silence might come from the Torah, might come from Bayidam Aaron, that Aaron was silent. It was the reaction to a tragedy. You can do some research and try and work it out. I, but again, the Torah comes first, and I wonder where the secular philosophy of the minute silence comes from my guess is it comes from the Torah but anyway we see that Hashem is asking us because it's in the Torah this is a way to react it's a good way to react and 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 there's a famous story about the Chobot time and the great Chobot time we quote many times here probably our greatest sage in the past 200 years when he also had a son that passed away Kudur Bavram. when he died he was known to have said he was just saying to himself the famous Verse in Habakkuk, in chapter 2, verse 4, Hashem nosan, Hashem lokach, Hashem gives, Hashem takes, Hashem gives, Hashem takes, ye shame Hashem mevorev, may Hashem's name be blessed. Can you imagine? L lost his son, he must have been devastated beyond traumas, be traumatized, and yet he's able to bless Hashem, ye shame Hashem mevorev, Hashem nosan, Hashem lokach, Hashem gives. Hashem takes, when they asked him a few days later in the shiva, how have you been able to have that reaction? He said, there's a famous story from the Toldos Odom, where there was a woman in the Inquisition. I'm assuming it's referring to the Spanish Inquisition. And in front of this mother, they slaughtered two of her children. And how did she react? This is what she said. She turned to Hashem and said, Hashem, till now, my love for you has been divided between my love for you and my love for, for my children. Now the love I had for my children, I can now be focused on my love for you. I give you that love. And that's what the Chovetz Chaim said. The Chovetz Chaim said, Hashem, I'm going to give you the love I have for my, my son. I'm now going to give to you. How does one do that? And that's my question tonight for you. This is our journey tonight. To have a journey of how does one get to that level of emunah that Aaron Cohen had, that the time had, that this woman, this mother had during the Crusades. How is it possible to get to that level? So let's learn about it tonight. Let's go on a journey. Stay with me. And, and let's see. This could be one of the most important 40 minutes now of your life, because we're really going to try and help you develop emuna muscles. And that's what it's about. Our goal at the end of the day, our spirituality is King David says, before it's beset or emuna, all the mitzvahs are emuna, or another amazing line from Chabakuk, Sadiq be emunoso Who's the Sadiq? He lives with his emuna. Sadiq be emunoso He's living through emuna. That's how he lives. Lukhan Kanievsky, he was the Tsar of Torah, but he embodied Emunah. He had total Emunah Hashem. 
He knew everything's from Hashem. So let's try and understand how we get that. We'll give you a bit of a, a, a roadmap of how to achieve emona in your life. So you're ready. You're ready. You're strapped in. Ready for the ride now. Here we go. Let's go. First of all, as we said, we always need to source everything. We need to source everything. So is there actually a mitzvah in the Torah to have emunah? What do you think? Give me a, give me a just message in on, on the chat on Facebook. Is that actually, is it one of the 613 mitzvot to have emunah, to have faith? So, so it's actually a discussion and arguments amongst the halachic sages. Maimonides, the Rambam, writes, in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, if you want to check it out, in chapter one, he starts off, the further beginning of Maimonides starts off with this, Yisod HaYisod, is the foundation of everything. And the pillar of all wisdom is L'yeda Shiesh Motzai Rishon, to know, to know that Hashem is the source of everything. The, the source of everything, the root of everything, the not so rishon is Hashem. And then he goes on to say in, in law number six, he says the following. Then this knowledge is mitzvah. It's one of the mitzvahs of the positive 248 mitzvahs in the Torah. And then he quotes the verse. Anyone know which verse do you think it would be? It's the verse, my friends, in the Ten Commandments. The first of the Ten Commandments. On Nochi Hashem Elikecha, Asher Tzitzich Omeret Tzitzrayim. I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. And critically, why is the mitzvah of Emunah discuss us coming out of Egypt, which should now be a little good prep for us to start getting in the Pesach spirit. You know, during the next few weeks of your life, you need to start preparing to leave Egypt. Because I really hope you get out of Egypt this year. Our job is to get out of Egypt. Of our Egypt is a state of mind. Egypt is that stress and anxiety and hardships that you have. That's what the limitations. That's Egypt, and every year on Pesach, Hashem can will, if you want, to get lifted out of Egypt, and please God, you will. So we need to start thinking about Pesach. Why is there Muna got to do with coming out of Egypt? And explains the, the commentators the following. It doesn't say, I am Hashem, you God who created the world. That's easy peasy. That's obvious. That's like, uh, obviously. Otherwise, how are we here? How are we here? I'm I'm connecting to you via Zoom. Anyone would think Zoom is just a random coincidence that, that we're speaking to each other and it's just lucky. There's just this piece of metals that just combusted and it's not allowing us all to speak to each other. You'd think I was a lunatic to say that, but yet how many atheists will say that's how the world's come about? Just through luck, through randomness, the human mind, the human heart, the universe is all just a random coincidence obviously it's not obviously there needs to be a creator a designer otherwise how on earth are we here and and therefore actually belief that god is the creator of the world that's not even emuna that's just blatantly obvious do you know what emuna is my friends emuna is that hashem has taken you by the hand and led you out of your troubles of your life and led you out of your challenges and has been there for you from day one, and you felt it and you've known it, that's emona. Meaning is the belief in what's called hashkacha protis, divine providence, belief that Hashem doesn't just create the world, everything comes from Hashem. Everything, the fact that it's sunny today in England, Hashem decided, okay, these poor guys in England, they haven't seen the sun for four months, right? They're all getting too depressed by now. I think it's not fair. We're on Rosh Hashanah, I promised them they at least get a, a bit of light in their lives. So finally, the sun can come out for at least a week, right? And, and, and everything from the weather to your business deals to one's health, as we're going to see soon, everything's from Hashem. It's belief in divine providence of every certain, every specific aspect comes from Hashem. That, my friend, is the mitzvah. That's the emunah. That's the emunah. By the way, there's a, an opinion from the Bahag who doesn't quote it as one of the 613 mitzvahs. And the Ramban, one of these explains, like he said, the reason it's not one of the 613 mitzvahs, it's even more important than a mitzvah. Emunah is the prerequisite for all mitzvahs. Emunah is the source of everything. If you don't have emunah, and then you're keeping Shabbos, so 
really it's a ritualistic act because if you really believed that Hashem created the world and is creating the world constantly and every week wants to rest and wants you to have that intimacy with him, if you don't believe any of that, then to be quite honest, what are you doing when you're doing Shabbos? If it's just a cultural, habitual thing that my family have done it years and years and years, it's good to still do, but you're missing the whole point. It's almost like the battery is not in. To put the battery in, Emunah is the battery. And Emunah is what builds your love between you and Hashem. It's what builds that relationship. It's what makes the mitzvahs work, in a sense. So that's the background. That's the mitzvah. The question is, my friends, how do we achieve it? How do we achieve it? So let's start off with two classic pieces of Talmud, which talk about how to achieve emunah the way Aaron did it in this week's Edra, the way that hopefully you'll be able to now as a consequence of tonight, be able to, to have this inbuilt reaction to life. When life happens, you just feel, oh, it's all good. It's all good. Where does it come from? Let's start off with the famous story about Rabbi Akiva. So if you want to look it up online, if you go to Safaria, you go to 60B in Safaria and Talmud Brachot. It's in Talmud Brachot, page 60B. And it says the following. It says there's a famous story of Rabbi Akiva. who was once traveling along the road and he reached a certain city. He requested lodgings, but no one provided him any. He said, but whatever Hashem does is for the best. I have to say in Aramaic, that's the famous phrase. Called to Ovid Rahman al Whatever Hashem does is for the best. Whatever Hashem does is for good. He went and slept in the field. He had with him a rooster, a donkey, and a lamb, as you do. The wind came and blew out the lamb. And he said, Whatever Hashem does is for the good. A cat came and ate the rooster. He said, Whatever Hashem does is for the good. A lion came and ate the donkey. Whatever Hashem does is for the good, says Rabbi Kiva. That very night, an army came and captured the city. Rabbi Kiva said to them, did I not tell you that whatever Hashem does is for the good? Meaning if those three elements would have been there, that would have alerted the robbers and they could have killed Rabbi Kiva. So Hashem was actually protecting Rabbi Kiva all the way through and his immediate go-to reaction. And you need to find a reaction which works for you. The one that works for Rabbi Kiva is whatever Hashem does is for the good. But I believe it's topped by his teacher. His teacher was a great mystic called Nachum Ish Gamzu. It's called Nachum, the man Gamzu, who would say the famous line, this is for the good. Gamzu the Toba. This is good. This is good. This is good. What's the story about that? That's found in the Talmud, in page, in the Talmud called Ta'anit, Tractate Ta'anit, page 29b. And it says the following. Why was he called Nachum Ish Gamzu? Says the Talmud, the reason is that with regard to any matter that occurred to him, he would say, Gums are the Tova, this is for the Tova. And he, he brings an example. Once the Jews wished to send a gift to the house of the emperor, they said, who should go and present this gift? Let it be Nachamish Gamzu, because miracles happened to him. They were worried about the emperor could have killed him. So they said, you know, he's the one he's always protected. So they sent him with a chest full of jewels and pearls, and he went and spent the night in a certain inn. During that night, the residents of the inn arose and took all the precious jewels and pearls from the chest and filled it with earth. And the next day when he saw what had happened, instead of doing what we'd all do and crying and going to a therapist and falling into depression, and he just said, Gam Zulatova, this is for the good, this is good, this is amazing, great news, Baruch Hashem. And he believed it, that's the point, he believed it. When he arrived at the ruler's palace, they opened up the chest and they saw that it was filled with earth. The king wanted to put everyone to death at that point. He said, the Jews are mocking me. But Nachamish comes and said, no, no, king, comes in the Tova. This is good. This is really good. At that point, says the Talmud, and when you say comes in the Tova, sometimes Hashem literally manifests miracles. Eliyahu Novi, Elijah the prophet, is one of God's angels comes to every generation, every Brit Milah, and, and comes to us sometimes in our hour of need, Hashem sends him. He was there in the room and came before the ruler as one of the ministers. And he said to the ruler, perhaps this earth is from the earth of their father, Abraham. Because if it says in the Bible, when he threw earth, 
it turned into swords. And when he threw stubble, it turned into arrows. I think he's got some of the Abraham earth. Try it, O emperor. So what happened? So of course, of course they tried it. They tried it and what happened was, they started, they took it to battle. They were fighting a battle at that moment. They took the magic earth and amazingly it was the magical earth. All of a sudden, the earth started turning into spears, turning into arrows, turning into swords. And it started helping them win that victory. And they won a famous victory. And they came back and they lauded Nachamish Kamzu and they gave him whatever they wanted. And they said, you, the Jewish people really are people of miracles. And that story was one of the classic stories of Nachum Ishkamzu. And he's, by the way, buried in Tzfat. I really recommend you go and see him next time you go to Tzfat. His place, his grave is a very, very holy, holy place. Holy place. So what do we see from this? The question is, why do we need both stories, my friends? Any ideas? Why both stories? Why isn't one enough? The fact that the Talmud is what we always ask when we study Talmud. The fact that it brings both means one's not enough. Why do we, what do we learn from the fact there's two of them? Surely they're saying the same thing. And the mystics say something very deep. There's actually a very, very interesting argument about Emunah. Is Emunah the following? That essentially we say when something happens, nice to see you, James. Is that mona? Essentially, we say, Hashem, one day I'll understand. It really hurts right now. But in the end, good will come out of it. Good will unfold. It will eventually be good. Or do we say, no, 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 right now it's good. And I think that was the debate. Rabbi Akiva, who'd been through a terrible, tough life, and he, and he died in the most horrific situations, he was maybe more of a realist and said, sometimes life is tough, but eventually there's a, there's a reason behind that. And they say goal, and then everything turns around in the end. Nachum Mishkamzu, I believe, was going even one higher and saying, now it's good. <laughs> because there's a phrase in Eo, <laughs> evil doesn't come from Hashem. It's no, Hashem can't even do bad. It's like a loving parent. This, I love this analogy from the Baal Shem Tov, a loving parent. And Hashem loves us more than any parent loves a child. Hashem has unconditional love for us. And therefore, when Hashem brings us even tragedy, it's only from love. And it's only because it's good for us in the long run. So, so right now it's good. When, when, when you take your child to have an anesthetic, to, to, to have an injection, to have a vaccine, you're just doing it because you love them. It's only for their benefit. And that's the way Hashem treats us. And it goes even deeper. The Chazanish says, who was actually a relative to Rebbein, part of the same family, he would say that bitochen, which is another aspect of emuna, which is real trust in Hashem, real to have, to, to know, to put your trust in Hashem totally. He would say that bitochen means whatever Hashem does, we accept. We accept with love. The Baal Shem Tov says one step higher, like Rabbi Nachman, and says, actually, through positive thinking, that can literally transform even more goodness and blessings in your life. Kind of the law of attraction concept. And I really recommend step number one, if any of you are going through challenges right now, and Muna isn't merely, ah, oh, it will be okay. And Muna is, it's okay now. And Hashem is going to bring the solution right now. I can see the solution. I visualize the solution. I know the solution's coming. That's real emuna to know it's going to be okay right now. Like I said, Rav Kanyevsky needed a locust to appear. It just appeared. We can get to that level if with, the, with the right amount of emuna. That's step one. Step two, my friends, the way to be able to react the way Aaron Akron reacted when his sons died and by Yidam Aaron, he was silent. How did he have an element of emuna? I believe the following. And this is an amazing book that David knows very, very well. 
I really recommend that you all get a copy from Rabbi Arush, who Garden of Emunah. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's deep. I really feel we, you need to learn it 10 times and go through it. It's, it's very simple on one hand, but it's super deep. And it's, it's almost like water, which nourishes you. Your neshama needs it because it will build your emona muscles. It will build your emona muscles. And I want to read you a few lines where Rabbi Arish says. Line number one, he says the following. But with emona, we believe that life's stumbling blocks, barriers and hindrance are agents of Hashem's divine providence. Once you start understanding that everything's Hashem, then you're no longer bitter, insisted, and angry at that person, angry at that person, because it's not them. They're not the cause. That's why the Torah says, don't bear a grudge and don't take revenge. Says the Sefer Achinoch, why not? Because it wasn't them that did it. They were just agents. Someone hits you over the head with a cricket bat. There's no point being angry with a cricket bat or a baseball bat or Rifka. Because when Hashem uses and literally uses an agent for your challenge, that's what it is. It's just merely, it's just merely a challenge, everybody. And therefore, let's not get angry with that person because we need to see. And then he writes, we don't sink to frustration, anger, and depression when you know that your life setbacks are actually personal gifts from Hashem, says Rabbi Arish. How beautiful is that? Then another line that I liked that he said, he says this line, he says, and Muna not only helps us to understand the world around us, it's essentially our most powerful asset. And Muna girds us with phenomenal inner strength and enables us successfully to weather any of life's difficulties. Ups and downs, life's probably transitional periods can become easier when you have a Muna. And says Rebbe Nachman, one who has a Muna is truly alive and his days are always filled with good. Because when things go well, it's certainly good. But even when he has troubles, he knows it's good as well. Because Hashem loves him and everything comes from Hashem. And, and the one thing we know 100% is that Hashem loves us and, and will give us good, even if it doesn't feel good right now. Now, I believe what's really going to help us is to have what, we, what I call a world-to-come mentality. What does that mean? I believe where a lot of people get bitter and twisted and angry and depressed is they think all there is is this world. All there is is this world. If, if you think all there is is this world, actually it seems an unjust, horrific place at times. But once you start understanding that Hashem is infinite, your soul is infinite, and that's the real location where it's really at, you know, often people into their party world will say, you know where the party's really at? Yeah, the party's really at that address. The party's really at the world of truth, the world to come. That's where it's really going down. That's where the fun is being had. That's where the love, that's where the joy is being had. You must have a very holy cat, David, to, to, to be enjoying the emunah. You've got an emunah cat. It's pretty amazing. So, so like this. Let's start understanding how to have a world to come mentality. First of all, let me share with you the story that Rabbi Arush gives. Here we go. Very powerful story. Listen up. So there was a powerful, a beautiful young lady, which might be powerful as well, daughter of one of the community's most prestigious and respected families. The early year, years of her marriage, she was blessed with happiness, abundance, children. The modest wife became a wonderful mother utilizing every three minutes. She was very holy. She was saying a lot of Psalms. She cared for the community's poor and underprivileged. The husband, whose successful commerce carried him around. Also, every day he was prayed and learned Torah. They were a very holy couple. Suddenly, though, disaster struck. Their home, a bright beacon of charity, became the scene of agony. A drunken soldier, viciously abused, mutilated, and murdered the couple's three-year-old son. The entire community was appalled. How can it be? They were such an amazing family. And how can Hashem allow that? No one understood. Either some people actually started getting angry with God. And that's what happens in tragedy. Sometimes it can actually create distance, God forbid. But the couple reacted with their munah. They didn't change their lifestyle. 
They said, okay, Hashem. Hashem no son, Hashem no cloth, Hashem gives, Hashem takes. But surely they're after another tragedy stroke. This righteous merchant, the husband, had fallen deathly ill. Everyone started getting round and started to say psalms and pray for him and pray for him. But all the prayers didn't work. All the prayers didn't work. He passed away. And now the mother and widow has had it. That's it. She, she, she was just about holding on when her son died. Now she's gone. And she's just so down. She's so in pain. A few years passed. One Friday afternoon, the newly married son of the young widow came to wish her mother good Shabbos. She tried to smile, but she burst into tears. Mommy, said the young man, three years have passed already. You've cried enough. It says in the Talmud, you're only meant to cry for a year. After a year, you've got to move on with your life. Hashem doesn't want you to keep crying. Everything Hashem does, mommy, is for the best. When you're crying, it doesn't sadden us, it saddens your children, but it also saddens daddy as well in heaven. Please continue with your life. And the mom heard that. She said, you're right, enough. Am I, merc am I more merciful than Hashem? Of course not, I've always trusted Hashem. Why shouldn't I be happy? Okay. And she started to really access the first time in three years, a bit of happiness. And for the first time in three years, she actually went to sleep soundly and peacefully. All of a sudden, she brought a bit of a Muna back in. That night, she had a dream. She was standing in this beautiful garden. She knew this must be the next world. Amongst flowering trees, she saw an image of an old man with a long beard. He approached her and said, would you like to see your husband? He's waiting for you. She said, yes, please. He led her to a magnificent palace where a young man was giving a Torah lecture to thousands of people. Afterwards, he said, the rabbi giving the lecture, that was your husband. She turned to him and said, darling, why'd you leave me alone? And two, how have you become a top rabbi here? You weren't really a rabbi down here. You didn't know all this Torah. Where do you know all this from? The husband smiled and said, darling, so nice to see you. I love you. I miss you. But in a former life, I was actually a Torah scholar. I never got married. And when I died, I was told that I can't get to my place yet in the world to come until I get married and have children. So I was reincarnated for the sole purpose of marrying and having children. And that's exactly what I did. As soon as I completed my mission, as soon as I completed my tikkun, I was taken, Hashem said, okay, hey, you've done your project. Time now to come home. You've now excelled. You've now achieved what you did is to achieve. The husband said, now do you understand why I had to go, darling? She says, okay, that makes sense. But why our son? And why in such a brutal manner? So the husband said, do you know who our son really was? He was the lofty soul of a holy tzaddik. In his previous life, he was actually kidnapped at birth and raised. Not by Jewish mothers. And finally, at the age of three, he was redeemed by the community and became a great, great sage. After his death, he wanted to come back and actually be raised by a Jewish couple. And he begged Hashem, can I come back and be raised by a Jewish couple this time? Just for three years. So the wife said, okay, but why does he have to die so horribly? The husband said, since he was always going to die then, the same time, there was the town had sinned terribly. And there was going to be a catastrophe. So his soul volunteered and said, let me die in the most terrible death. And that can atone for the sins of our community. And that's why Hashem took him in the way he took him. And then the husband looked at her and said, you know why we were allowed to come and see me tonight? Because you've finally accessed the Munna. Because you've accessed the Munna, now Hashem is open. You're now open to seeing truth. You're now open to getting comfort. 
So what do we see from this very, 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 very deep story? Number one, there's a belief in the afterlife. Number two, there's a belief in reincarnation. So much of the traumas you've gone through in this world actually probably wasn't as a consequence of things you've done in this world. It was much more probably to do with previous lives and a much bigger picture. So there's one big, huge jigsaw puzzle, which everything will be understood and seen in the end. And right now, when you're living in that one dimension puzzle, just have a mona that you're part of a much bigger picture. And things will eventually be understood. And by the way, that idea about reincarnation, one of the greatest sages, we believe, had that story. There's a famous story with the Ariza. And he went to a Brit Milah. He went to a circumcision. And the, the baby boy died at the circumcision. And the parents wanted to know, how is that possible? Where? We just had circumcision. And now he dies. That's the a reward Hashem gives us. Arisa says, come back next year and I'll tell you. The parents came back the following year and Arisa says, do you know who your son was? He was a reincarnation of the great Rav Yosef Cairo, the code of Jewish law, who when he got to the world to come, he'd achieved everything apart from, he never had a Britney Lara eight days old. He was jaundiced, Rav Yosef Cairo, and didn't have a Brit on time. So he begged Hashem, Hashem, allow me to come back and have my Britney Lara on time. And Hashem said, only when it's parents that can have the level of emuna to handle it. So by the way, we see something else from this story. We see that when we have challenges, not only is our challenge exactly right for our soul, it's exactly right for the people around us in our life, because nothing's random. From a father to mother, to brother, to sister, to friend, to neighbor, everything that you're going to go through by proxy of the other person's challenge is exactly also what you need to go through as well. That's how amazing Hashem is. That's how perfect the system is. So that's one book I'd like you to look into. Another book is this really cool book called Living Emunah by Rabbi Asher. And I really recommend it. It's amazing. And again, like anything in life, if you want to learn it, you have to, if you want it, if you want to change, you've got to learn the material. You've got to learn the material. You, things aren't just going to come to you innately, even though Emunah is innate. There is a level of emunah which is innate. We need to learn the material to help you build that level of emunah. So let me start off with the following. It says like this. He says, a person on the highest level of emunah, you can recognize the hand of Hashem immediately. And that's what we need to go to. We need to learn to have an automatic reaction. Something happens straight away, Baruch Hashem. It's always Baruch Hashem. So always thank you, Hashem. Even when it's something we really don't like. You know, if, if one of my students is listening, he might be on Instagram. He was saying, whenever he got a good client placed, he would say Psalm 100, which is the thanks Psalm, the thank you Psalm. And I told him, even when a client, you lose the client, Let's say you think you're about to place the client. You're, 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 you're almost assuming it's going to happen. You're almost counting the money and then it doesn't happen. Like bad news happens financially. Say thank you then. Say thank you. Even though the, the, our gut, immediate, impulsive reaction needs to be, it's from you, Hashem, and thank you. It's from you and thank you. So, for example, there was a story here. Rabbi Lugasi tells a story that he was once standing near someone who was hammering a nail onto the wall. And suddenly the man shouted and he swore. And the, and the rabbi said, what had happened? He goes, hello, I just banged my finger, banged a nail into my finger. So the rabbi said, and I love this, like maybe there's a time I, I personally wouldn't do this, actually. Someone, you know, bangs a nail into their finger. I'm like, I call Hatzalah. I'm not going to give them a share at that point. But this rabbi was a bit more hard for. He said, oh, let me share with you something. There's a Talmud in Chulin, page seven, which says that no person even hurts your finger in this world unless it's been decreed in heavens. And you know how many things have to happen in heavens before you hurt your finger? There's a team of angels prosecuting against you and giving reasons you should get hurt. But there's another team of angels advocating against your behalf, explaining why you shouldn't. And the cases are brought to Hashem. And then Hashem looks at both and decides what's the best thing for you, if you need to get your finger hurt or not. Only after all that does then the hammer strike your finger. So don't be angry, because Hashem is the most righteous judge, and that's why we say the following blessing, 
even God forbid, when someone passes away, we say, Baruch Dayan Ha'emet. Blessed is the true judge. Hashem is the true judge. But let, let me just a secret. When a good news happens, we say, Baruch HaTov Ha'metiv. Blessed is the one who does good. When the Shia comes, we'll only ever make one blessing. We'll only make one blessing when the Shia comes. We're only going to say, Baruch HaTov Ha'metiv, because there's nothing. You'll see the good straight away. We don't even have to go through difficulties. So I really recommend that we need to get to this place where you're almost saying straight away, it's for the good. Baruch HaTovah Meitiv. There's a really cool story about, and I, I, I can feel this story because I like my sport. So a rabbi tells the story once that he... Uh, he sees some young boys from a young yeshiva coming to the American guys, coming to the Western world. And this American guy goes in and writes on his kvittel, on his letter to the Western world, Hashem, please help my baseball team win and find a way to tell me the score. Because he didn't have internet at that time. He didn't know how to get a hold of the score. That was his request. Anyway, he watched that his friend was very cheeky and went after the guy and opened the note and saw what his friend had asked. He opened the note and saw the request to find out the football score, so the baseball score. So he goes back to the guy and says, oh, by the way, do you know your team won? And it was 3-0. The boy was like amazed. Oh my gosh, Hashem's answered my prayers. Hashem's answered my prayers. So listen to this. This is very clever. They got to the yeshiva and they told the rabbi this story. And they said, what a joke. Obviously it wasn't Hashem. The guy read, read his letter. His friend read his letter. That's why he told him the score. The rabbi said, yeah, but Hashem did answer his prayers. He just used his friend to read his letter. In other words, when we start seeing that everything comes from Hashem, then even what seems super random and coincidental only comes because Hashem is this orchestrator, this puppeteer, setting everything up. Let's go deeper. There's a great rabbi that I really recommend you try and listen to some of his talks. There's a website called Torah Anytime. There's a really cool Hasidic rabbi called Rabbi Fischl Shachter. And he says lots of very cool stories. And he says the following story. He draws a comparison to a wealthy businessman who after an intense corporate meeting, went to the rooftop of the building to get some fresh air. As he stepped onto the roof, the door slammed shut behind him and locked. There was no one on the top floor. No one on the top floor who, who could hear him. And the building was too tall for anyone on the street to hear him. So he was now stuck upstairs on the roof. He decided he, he wants to catch someone's attention. He had some expensive coins in his pocket. So he took one and threw it down. The coin hit a man on the head and bounced on the floor. The man picked it up and said, wow, lucky. I've got a coin today. Awesome. Found money. And he kept on doing that. People kept on pocketing the money. But no one's looking up and seeing the man. He's like, hmm, this isn't working. So he took a rock and dropped it from the rooftop and it hit a man's foot. And the man's like, ow. And then he looked up and he found him. Listen to this genius story. This is Rabbi Schechter. That's too much like life for us. When things go well, we stay, look, ah, oh, that's lucky. That's nice. Look at me. I'm the man. It came from me. I'm such a great deal maker. Of course the deal happened. It's moi. It's all me. As soon as rocks come challenging to us, as soon as things come that we don't like, then we look up and we say, Hashem, why did you do that? We need my friends to do the opposite. We need, when the blessing comes, we say, thank you so much, Hashem. There shouldn't be a difference when the blessing comes than when the rocks come crashing. Because ironically, the rocks only come crashing when we're not looking up. Do you see the genius of the story? If when the bless, it's all about Amunah, life's about Hashem wants you to love it and have a relationship with him. So when the blessing happens, if you can say thank you so much, and then you say your halal, and then you say your psalms, Please, God, you don't need to then have the rock falling on your head because you've already learned the lesson. You're already looking up. That's Rabbi Shechter's beautiful, beautiful muscle, beautiful parable.
Next one, Reb Desler says, one of the keys to emuna is perseverance. You gotta keep working hard. Emuna is not easy. It's not easy. Spiritual growth, my friends, isn't easy. Pesach is easy, meaning sometimes Hashem lifts you out of Egypt. Sometimes you get a lift. Sometimes you get what we call artificial inspiration. But the real growth, the real emuna comes from what we call amelus, toiling, dedication, not giving in when others might give in. And he brings a few stories. And there's this amazing line. I want you to write this down. It's worth coming for this line tonight. Ain dova Nothing gets in the way of desire. If you really have that desire and, and, and that emuna in that desire, then the amazing can happen. Challenge can go away. You'll succeed. And he brings a few stories. Number one, there's a rabbi called Rabbi Arya Lee Ginsberg. He was called the famous Shagas Arya. The first Shagas Arya, the first book he wrote, was world famous. Everyone's got it on their shelf. But the other two books, Boris Ari and Ture Evan, many people don't have them. And they asked him, what's the difference between the first book, which is like the bestseller, and the other two, which is like, didn't go down so well. So he said the following. He said the first book, the rabbis of the past generation said, you know why? Because he had to write it under very difficult circumstances. He suffered from poverty, persevered and struggled. And when you struggle when your book is tainted with tears coming from your eyes and that's what it's all of a sudden then bang, that's when that's why the from Sarah Agra one of the reasons sometimes Hashem sends us challenges is not because he's angry with us it's not because he wants to punish us it's actually he loves us so much but he knows that through that challenge you'll work harder and then earn that great treasure at the other side of the rainbow research. and there's another great sage who really was famous for this called Rabnosan Svi Finkel who became the famous Rosh Hashiva of Mir my friends he was one of the great sages like Rapam Kenievsky but in 1980 he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and he had a very severe level of Parkinson's disease he didn't want to take medication he didn't want to forget his Torah and he just continued his same level of incredible amelus and toil with Parkinson's. With Parkinson's. Isn't that amazing? To the extent that there was one occasion where he got to the yeshiva and he was so ill, he couldn't do it. And he tried and he couldn't do it. And then he wrote down two words to ask to give instead of a shir. Slichan nesiti. I'm sorry, but I tried. And they said that class, when he just said those two words, left more impact than any. Because when you see how much something means to someone, that's one of the reasons he was rewarded with the Mary Yeshiva became the number one Yeshiva, the most famous Yeshiva in the world. A lot of it came down to his incredibly hard work. Incredibly hard work. Next story. So several years ago, there was a 16 year old girl from the community in, in, in America, and it was tragically taken, it was tragically she died, she had an accident at the beach that resulted in a broken nose, Anna anesthesia, she died. Her parents were called Dr. and Mrs. Gorsi. They wanted to do something for the elevation of her soul. So they established a weekly Torah learning program for their daughter's friends. Each week, some 30, 40 girls met and they got inspiration. More recently, the Gorsis decided to build a mikveh in their neighborhood in their daughter's memory. A mikvah, for those who don't know, is there's a, there's a very special mitzvah for men and women to go into a, a ritual called a pure rainwater, and it makes us pure. That's how someone converts Judaism. It's very important in every community to have a mikvah, and they wanted to, so it's a big thing to do in their daughter's merit. It's a, well, a huge mitzvah to build a, a mikvah, and they want to do that, but the cost of construction turned out to be very high. Very, very high, more than they, they, they could afford. And there was $25,000 that he still owed. And the contractor said, we're not going ahead until you pay them the, the next $25,000. So the doctor's literally on the phone having this, this conversation with his contractor. And he's very upset. He goes, 
and you can see the doctors getting more and more upset, puts the phone down. The patient in the doctor's surgery heard part of the conversation, as we do, he said, is everything all right with your daughter? And Dr. Gersi explained the situation. He said, actually, I lost my daughter, but we wanted to do a good deed for her. And we wanted to go and build this mikvah. And the patient, true story, the patient in the surgery said, let me go and have a look at it. I'm interested. Maybe I can help donate. So the doctor brought the patient to the construction site and she was so impressed. There on the spot, she wrote a check for the last $25,000. Problem solved. Listen to this. Several days later, Mrs. Gersi called her rabbi and said she needed to speak to him. The rabbi came and saw that she was emotional. She explained that the patient had come to her home to tell her that her daughter had just come to her in a dream. She was sitting at a beach with a beautiful glow on her face. And she said, thank you so much for completing the mikvah. It's going to help me tremendously. And thank my parents for all the good deeds, especially the weekly Torah classes. They need to know for every girl who attends, there's another five who don't. And they need to try and help them come as well. And to make sure my mother believes you that I'm having this, this is real, tell her to take out from my drawer the ring she gave me for my 16th birthday with the emerald. Mrs. Gersi told the rabbi there was no way the patient would have known about this ring. And obviously it was a true dream. So again, you see, my friends, when you have a munah, the amazing can happen. Like, Hashem has got a plan. There's a bigger picture, my friends, a much, 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 much bigger picture. I'm in the mood for stories, if that's all right. So I want to finish off with another few stories. This is a true story. Man from Eretz Israel, from Israel, said that over 30 years ago, two months before, his and his twin brother's bar mitzvah, the father had grown up in the... Listen to this, it's so beautiful. The father had grown up in, 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 in America, but raised his family in Israel, brought the twin boys on a trip to his hometown. And one day they went to visit his old friend, who was the rabbi. When they arrived at the rabbi's house, he was rushing to leave. He said, I'm so sorry. I need to go and save a life. They said, what do you mean? He said that the couple in his congregation waited 10 years for a child. And now the child was suffering from a rare illness. The doctors said the prognosis was not promising. And the only chance of survival was a certain procedure which cost $20,000, all of which had to be paid up front. The couple had only $10,000 and the rabbi was going to raise... The remaining sum, the man told the story to the father and asked him to donate 10000 He goes, can you save a life for $10,000? So the father said, the trip's costing me a lot of money and I need money for the bar mitzvah. I can't afford another $10,000. Listen to this. The boy told his father, this little 12-year-old boy said to his father, I don't need a bar mitzvah. I don't need a celebration. Rather, give that money, forget about bar mitzvah. And these two brothers agreed that they could use their bar mitzvah money to save this boy's life. True story. And that was it, done. They used their bar mitzvah money to save the boy's life. A couple of months later, back in Israel, the twins celebrated their bar mitzvah at home over a little cooked dinner for a couple of people, their family. In the middle of the meal, the rabbi from the United States walked in and said, can I speak? He explained to the guests, that the boys were celebrating the bar mitzvah at home rather than a big, beautiful place because they wanted to try and save a baby. He said, I'm involved with lots of chesed projects. We want to give you two boys the award for the greatest act of kindness this year. And they brought a beautiful plaque and they got that on their bar mitzvah. And the procedure was successful. We hope the boy's going to live. So we're hoping it's going to work. So it was hopefully worth it. Listen to this. 22 years later, the man who told the story made a bar mitzvah for his own son. His father and the twin brother joined him. All of a sudden, that rabbi from the United States, obviously was in contact with the family, comes in, accompanied by a young couple and their two young children. The family welcomed the rabbi and asked him to speak. And he handed the microphone to this young husband. And he said the following, 22 years ago, you and your brother gave up your bar mitzvah to help save a baby's life. I've been waiting for my entire life the opportunity to thank you because I was that baby and you saved my life. And here's my wife and two little children and your good deed has brought a whole family to the world. Isn't that beautiful? We don't understand the power of emunah and the power of kindness. 
and the power of charity. Just finish off with one, one last story from Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. Because one of the problems is, my friends, sometimes we get confused. We start, and this is one of the things which gets involved, gets in the way of the Munah. We start attributing credit to ourselves because we work hard. And there's this principle called Hishtadlus. I'll come to you in a minute. I'll come to you in a minute. We, we have this principle called Hishtadlus, putting effort in. And we start thinking that it's our effort, which is sometimes the cause of our success. And therefore, we don't really appreciate Hashem because we say it was down to me. Listen to this. Says Rabbi Nachman, for all those of you who work really hard at work and feel you've got to put the work in. Says Rabbi Nachman, in this word called Hishtadlus. And again, we do Hishtadlus. We have to put work in because we're not allowed to rely on the miracles. And it's really is a consequence of an Adam and Eve sins. We sinned. The punishment was, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. We now have to go to work, not as an ideal, but because we're hiding the miracle. We're playing hide and seek with Hashem. It's a tax. Says Rabbi Nachman, listen to this analogy. There were two wealthy brothers. Two wealthy brothers who lived across the street from each other. One was very generous and hospitable, while the other was a miser. Once a traveler was passing through the town, and asked where he would be able to be hosted for a warm, nourishing meal. He was directed to the generous brother. He mistaken and went to the miser. He knocked on the door and explained that he was looking for a warm meal. The miser said, sure, but first of all, you've got to come and help me. You've got to do four hours of work, moving furniture, carrying heavy items, several flights of stairs. After four hours, said to the miser, oh, now you can go to the house across the street and they'll give you a nice hot meal there. So now the traveler exhausted, famished, crosses the street, knocks on the brother's door and is looking for a place to eat. And he said, sure, of course, let me come and give you, give him a delicious dinner. After the meal, the traveler said, I'm very upset. I spent four hours doing hard work for the man across the street. And I just get one meal. And he told the story to the host. I'm sorry to tell you, the host said, you've worked four hours for nothing. You work for my brother who gave you nothing. The meal you received was given to you free by me, but not because of your work. The guest had to do work before receiving keeping his meal, but not is that the work produced the meal. Let's try and understand. When we go to work, it's not that your work is producing your money. Mm -mm. It's a tax. Sometimes we have to go through, ironically, to play the game of the Muna. Are you going to mistake and say, it's down to me? It's down to me. It's down to the work. Look how amazing I am. I'm the best artist. I'm the best singer. I'm the best musician. I'm the best accountant in the world. I'm the best lawyer in the world. I'm the best recruitment agent in the world. It's down to me. Or is that the game? Is that the mask? You've got to put the work in. And by the way, you should enjoy the work and do the work, but don't, God forbid, think it's down to you. If you realize, my dear friends, that it's all coming from Hashem, Ain od Movado, all there is is Hashem. Learn how to say that. By the way, we spoke about Rakhine Kanievsky at the beginning. His great father was called the Stipe Lagan, one of the greatest geniuses of all. When one famously, one young boy went to try and get a blessing from him, he was quite deaf, so he couldn't. He walked into his house and he just heard the Stipe say over and over this, Ani ma'amin emunah shalema. I believe with complete faith. The first of Rab, the Rambam's 13 principles of faith. Shahaboyre yisparach shemoda, the creator who boyre omani l'chola brim. He creates and sustains everything. Everything's Hashem. That's how a tzaddik becomes a tzaddik. Tzaddik, they become a tzaddik because they become a tzaddik because they're their emuna. And that's what I really wish for you and bless you that you find in you, find in you the ability to have emuna, the ability to withstand challenges, the ability whenever Hashem brings, maybe sometimes the challenges we see straight away, they're not challenges, they're blessings and they're opportunities. And we say thank you. For Hashem, straight away, Gamzu the Tova, like Nachamish Gamzu, we say, this is also good. Wishing you tremendous success and, and Yeshua's and salvations for us all. We have a question on Zoom. Go yes, for it. Rabbi. Hi, how are you? Great, thank God. Go for it. Okay, I'm calling in from America. If you don't mind, I just want to share something with everyone. It's less than two minutes about Sadaka. My father um, grew up in a not an Lubavitch, in a not Lubavitch home, and he told the Balkaira, he was very worried about, my grandfather said he was very worried about his boys, that they wouldn't be Yerushalayim. So he said, if you're worried about them, 
why don't you send them to Lubavitch Yeshiva on Ocean Parkway? And my grandfather said, first of all, I need to get my children to agree to switch schools in the middle. And second, it's much more expensive. It's not a Yeshiva, it's a real school. They said, okay, don't worry about the Skar Limud. You'll pay the same price you're paying for education. Just speak to your boys. So my father said he was a bit of a mischievous boy. He was eight years old and he was happy to take off the school. He went in, he brought food to sell in the canteen and he loved it. He said he'd stay. And as he walked out, the Rebbe said, one minute, you know, it was before the boards. Who's paying for this? So um, Rabbi Kunin, Mendel Kunin said, don't bother the father. I'll make sure you get paid. A few years later, my, my grandfather passed away and Rabbi Kunin called up the Rebbe and the yeshiva and said, don't bother Mrs. Bernstein. Whatever she could pay, she could pay. And I'm going to pay the difference until he graduates. And he made sure that my father went to the best yeshivas, got smicha from the best rabbi. And he passed away and that was it. He never needed a thank you. My father and mother became grandparents. And after they were grandparents, they had two more children. When he was 56 years old, he had my last brother, Salman Shimon. And Salman Shimon, two year, three years ago, got married to Mendel Kunin's great-granddaughter. Now, none of us knew this story, but at the wedding, my, my father got up and he said, look at this, the power of tzedakah. Who would have known that helping an eight-year-old orphan boy, that he'd really be helping himself because what happened? The great-grandchildren are the same. So my father's son married Rabbi Mendel Kunin's great-granddaughter. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank You're you welcome. So much. Let me just finish off with one beautiful idea that I forgot to mention from one of my great teachers, Sodaka Cohen. And he says the following, I hopefully you'll enjoy this. He says like this, he says, any time you feel a bit of fear, a bit of anxiety, actually that's Hashem putting it in your heart so that you can daven, so that you can pray. Again, it's an amazing outlook. Sometimes we get fear and anxiety and we say, whoa, I need an antidepressant or I need an anti-anxiety or I need to speak to a therapist. Actually, you need to speak to Hashem. He's your therapist. And then Rabbi Nachman talks something called hispodidus, which is learning even just to talk to God. Just go somewhere quiet and just open your heart to Hashem. So again, from sort of saying when that feeling comes, when that feeling comes, actually, it's, it's a sign that actually Hashem wants you to daven, and then when you pray, please God, it's going to unlock the, 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 the salvation. Because at the end of the day, it's all about prayer. There's a very amazing, I'll finish off with this. It says, it says the following, King David says in Psalms, I have emuna as I speak, meaning your emuna is really understood and built through speech, through the way you talk to Hashem, through the way you pray to Hashem, through your relationship, through your conversation. So often the anxiety comes in. That's Hashem trying to get you to pray for it because then when you pray, that's coming on lock. Again, Hashem wants it to work for you. <laughs> Hashem wants your life to map out and to be super successful. So sometimes when you go through the challenges, they're there to help us ironically get to where we need to get to. So, so yeah, so when, let's say, the anxiety comes in. So then just to say, let's say you've got anxiety about how you're going to pay the bills, how you're going to pay the bills. So then you say, that means Hashem wants you to daven to him, because then if you daven to him, it's going to help. So then you just say the words. Obviously, we should always, you know, start it with Psalms. I'm very into Psalms, as you know. So, so for livelihood, Psalms is number 23. For health, it's 130. For a shidduch. 121. So for getting rid of the evil eye, number 91. For clarity, it's number 27. So say the right psalm, but then Hashem wants to hear from you. And I'll finish with this one last beautiful idea from Rabbi Biederman. He says an amazing thing. I told you I could speak about Emona all night. He says, if you ever have pas pasalo, pas pasalo means bread in your basket, which means if you can afford to pay the, more, the, the bills this month, you're not allowed to worry about finance. You're not allowed to worry about what will be in three months or six months or nine months or even two months. It says the Talmud, if you can pay the bills this month, Baruch Hashem, you shouldn't even be focused on, and it's so interesting, because we're living in this Western culture, that we are, we have this long-term vision, but what about six months, and what about six years, and what about three years, and what about 30 years? By the way, it's amazing how many people worry about things that will never even happen. People worry themselves to death sometimes, they worry themselves, and, and that, that thing never happens, or they never get a chance to reach that phase. So let's just enjoy every day as we have them. As they say, live every day 
like it's last. And critically, is this is the idea. If you can pay your bills this month, you're not allowed to worry about grandmas. And I give you all a blessing. You'll never, ever, ever in your, your whole lives ever have to worry about livelihood of this quote. I'll find out the quote where I was looking for a Bidimus quote. He, he quotes that. It's in his booklet, Svi, and I'll let you know the quote where that is when I find it. Lots of love, everybody. Tremendous success in your lives. And please, God, I will see you all on Sunday night at eight o'clock for our Path of the Just class. Really, really enjoyed spending time with you, learning about Emuna. Next week, we'll do Path of the Just, and then we'll have the power of speech. We'll learn about how to stop speaking Loshon Hara, the power of Loshon Hara. It's the power show all about not speaking Loshon Hara next week. And, and we're going to learn, hopefully give you tips and strategies how never, ever, ever for the rest of your life ever to speak Loshon Hara ever again. And then in two weeks time, we have the amazing, incredible, legendary Rabbi, Dr. Akiva Tatz. So awesome. Wishing you tremendous success, everybody. You can message me if you have any questions. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do, J Network 613. It, do me a favor, it comes out on YouTube tomorrow. If you enjoyed it, send it to someone that's never heard it before that you feel a bit of emona might give them a bit of warmth in their life. So please send the video out there. Good Shabbos, everybody. Lots of love. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice to see you. Everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Good night. See you, Sandra. See you, Tzvi. Bye, good night.